Okay, we are recording. Oh, yeah. on, take it away. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Now we are. We're, oh. we're recording. Yep. Yes. Good. Okay. So, mm -hmm. welcome to the virtual interim of the WebRTC World. <laughs> Just to remind everybody of the IPR policy, we're abiding by the W3C patent policy and only people and companies that are listed on this link are allowed to make substantive contributions to the specs. So during this meeting, we hope to make progress on open issues in WebRTC ICE, media capture, and WebRTC NB use cases, as well as to decide on proposals for substantive changes to WebRTC PC. We'd also like to introduce our new co-chair, Yanivar. Say hello, Yanivar. Hello, all. Just some basic info. Mm -hmm. There is an entry on the wiki that tells you all you need to know. It has links to these slides. We also have links to the latest drafts. We would like to have a scribe. Does someone volunteer? I can scribe. Thank you, uh, Eric. Basically, all we need to do is to note the decisions that we've made. Mm -hmm. And the meeting is being recorded, so we can move on. OK, so we've got one issue, one PR on WebRTC ICE, um, some discussion on a media capture issue from UN, a few things on NV use cases. And then we'll get to WebRTC PC for the rest of the meeting. OK, uh, WebRTC ICE PR22. Is Peter on the call? Well, uh, I can maybe try to do it slide. his slide. It's not very big. Basically, uh, Peter has put together a PR on initial flex ICE methods and attributes. Uh, hasn't gotten feedback from developers yet. But the big question he has is whether anyone's interested in implementing any part of it. Any thoughts from anyone in the audience? Could someone explain flex ICE? It's basically pushing, uh, pu pushing ice uh, through the through um, pu pushing ice ice through manipulating the the ice the ice ice transport instead of uh, get, getting all the pushing done by peer connection. So it uh, adds things like. Uh, like uh, adding and removing candidates and selecting which one you nominate and so on. So it gives a lower layer uh, interface and it, it theoretically should enable you to use an ice, ice transport without using a peer connection. Well, that's, uh, it's WebRTC ICE gives you that part of it. But then Flex Ice is an enhancement to it that gives you more low level control. Yeah, more pushes. Yeah. So, um, as an action item, I think what probably the next step would be to announce this to the list and ask the same question. Um, and uh, if we don't have uh, any feedback from implementers interested in in doing this, then uh, we should abandon it? That's a question. Yeah, that's a question. Uh, well, also, there'd be, uh, it's not just implementers, I think, uh, developers as well. And that's, I think, part of what the Weber to CNB effort is, right, to figure out what the requirements are and whether that includes FlexIce. Uh, and we will, uh, later in this session, we'll be talking about uh, some things in distributed hash tables that might relate to it, but we'll see. So, so I'm just trying to understand what this might do for a developer. Like, you might be able to say, hey, uh, I don't like the look of that 
v6 address let's just not nominate it is that the sort of logic that you might apply because it's to do with your app or some some app behavior I'm, I'm trying to work out why how this level of granularity gets useful gets to be useful yeah if it's a remote candidate you can already do that in, in per connection but, um, <laughs> You know, if it's your if it's your own candidate, there are things like filtering of attributes. You may decide I don't want to. Uh, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it, would be the pair, it would be on the pairing, not necessarily the candidates. It would be like this particular pair mm, don't like the look of it mm. for some reason. I can't think why for the moment. But is that that the kind of use case that's envisaged? Uh, yeah, that's that's one of them. Um, you know, as an an example of that, actually, would be where you want to bring up the connection immediately. So you want a, a candidate involving a turn server, a relay candidate, which you can bring up immediately. Uh, but it wouldn't necessarily be the ultimate uh, candidate. Um, so you might want to find something else that's less expensive. Uh, but you want to bring up that, that turn candidate immediately. And, and as an example, you want to keep it as, a, as an alternative so that you can always fall back to it if the other one, if the other candidate uh, fails. Oh, so you could then subsequently change the nomination in the software? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, I mean, I can see kind of use cases for that where, you know, the user starts to do something expensive and you, you think, well, well, maybe we won't use turn for that. Yeah. No, it, one of the things it can give you is the ability to maintain a connection through interface changes because you can use turn mobility and keep that turn candidate alive even as you move around uh, and then search for less expensive candidates uh, as they come in and out. Okay. Um, but, well, I, I mean, I think one thing is to tie the NB use cases to things that might need this, uh, which some of which we'll talk about later. Okay, so I think we have our next steps on this one. Okay, uh, next is media capture issues, and UN has two PRs to present. So go ahead, UN. Okay, um, so the first PR is to uh, acknowledge in the spec that uh, some implementations are using device IDs which are not origin unique. So there's Chrome that has. Um, the default value for device ID, which is not origin unique. And Safari also exposed the empty string device ID value uh, in animate, when uh, calling enumerated devices, as long as the page uh, has not a device info permission. Um, currently, the specification is requiring device ID to be origin unique. And uh, my understanding is that this is to prevent user tracking um, so that you cannot correlate a user um, <clears throat> between different origins using uh, device IDs. Uh, but clearly, um, some values like default and empty string do not create any cross-origin information leakage. So there's no issue with user tracking for those uh, values. So the proposal uh, here is to relax a little bit the spec so that we, we say that uh, device IDs should be origin unique, uh, at least per device type. Um, and in case uh, where there's no cross-origin information uh, issue, the identifier can also be uh, reused across origins. Um, so the PR is trying to do that. It's, uh, it's keeping the fact that um, Whenever an identifier is not is tied to a user, so the identifier is privacy sensitive, uh, uh, a cross-origin domain must not be able to guess the value uh, in any way. Um, so I think basically uh, this PR is um, privacy neutral, and it's describing uh, it's aligning with what implementations are doing. So that's it for PR. Are there any objections to this PR proposal? Okay. You do you okay with it? Yep. That doesn't make sense to you? Or is it just not objectionable? No, no, it makes sense. 
I support the, the PR. Okay, let's go for it. Okay, so it sounds like uh, there's support for the PR. Uh, why don't we look at the next one, Yuen? Yeah. <coughs> so, um, so this is specific to Safari, but we, we're using the empty string for device IDs. Um, and currently, Safari is treating the empty string for device ID constraint as if the constraint is not specified. So if you are saying that there's an exact device ID uh, constraint with the empty string, we uh, we do not look at it, and we 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 provide you um, a stream with um, the first, basically the first uh, matching um, device. Um, we are doing that for compatibility with the existing web pages because some pages are calling enumerate devices first, then they are picking the first audio or camera device, and then they are uh, using that device ID with get user media. Um, <clears throat> my understanding is that this pattern might be useful in some cases, like uh, at least in Firefox, for instance, the first, apparently the first audio, uh, the first device that is listed in, in, in the enumerate devices list is the default system one. So some applications might use that to actually pick the, the default one. And um, we, we do not want to break them. Uh, so that's why we, we're doing that. Um, so the proposal in this PR is to interpret the empty string as if the constraint is not specified. So it's very similar to uh, the existing case in the spec where uh, an empty array is considered as, uh, as if the constraint is not specified. <coughs> it would, of course, only apply to dumb string constraint, uh, so which means facing mode besides mode device ID group ID. Uh, currently, in Safari implementation, we are only uh, implementing that for device ID, but we uh, we would uh, update our implementation uh, for all four modes. Um, so the PR that is written 595 is uh, specific to the empty strict value. Uh, we have not chased uh, cases like uh, an array containing an empty string. Although we could uh, also do the same, I guess. So meaning that if it's an array, we would filter any um, empty string before considering it. Um, it does not seem to be uh, an issue in terms of compatibility to fix the particular case of uh, the, uh, the array. So I don't have any strong preference there. Um, yeah, that's the description. Any feedback? Uh, how does this uh, does this does this make uh, existing implementations non-compliant? Does it uh, which implementation? Uh, well, Chrome. Chrome and Firefox. Um, so I think Chrome and Firefox do not uh, provide the anti-string device ID. Uh, so in practice, it might it might not happen. But it's true that if you craft uh, get user media and you pass an, pass an empty string device ID, um, probably um, Firefox and Chrome will fail. So it would require changes to uh, Firefox and Chrome to uh, align with it. I haven't done the, uh, the test there, but I would guess that's probably the case. Yeah, I think so too. Um, this is Yanivar. Um, so one thing, if we do it to all constraints, like resize mode, the existing language on resize mode, I, I notice, does say the string has to be one of the members of the video resize mode enum. So in general, um, this would allow empty strings where we don't right. uh, allow today. So I'm wondering if you've considered a more narrower, um, and also the backwards compatibility that was just mentioned um, made me think about. Um, I mean, in, in practice, this is done so that uh, the device IDs you get back from enumerate devices will work and get user media. Right. That is the intent, right? So I'm yeah. wondering if we could solve this without uh, specifically for device ID. Right. If that would be sufficient and be uh, more com more compatible. I'm fine with it. It's uh, in Safari implementation. We are only doing that for device ID. 
Um, so I can probably try to change the PR to specifically narrow it down to uh, device ID. I, I would support that. Yeah. Uh, for, for phrasing terms, that uh, that is for uh, you can only for device ID, and it means that uh, if you should merely accept any ID provided by enumerated devices, then that, that would be that would be better. Uh, so it it uh, it actually makes us non-compliant because if you com com constrain on device ID. Single quotes. Exact. Exact. It will fail. It will. It yeah. will fail all constraints. Um. Sure. So I don't. See, I don't see that as a big deal, though. Should be. Should be easy to fix, and and uh, no, nobody who, you, who is currently getting a device will uh, be impacted. It's only people who are currently not getting a device that would. Then get the default device. But uh, but if if the default device has an empty device ID, wouldn't would it not succeed in the constraint algorithm? It well, it it's not. it's only in stuff. It's only with the application of the previous C, uh, PR that uh, that an empty de device ID is even allowed. So right, because right. But, but I'm saying. Um, the the important part is that every device ID uh, exposed with enumerated devices be usable and get used immediately, and that seems to be the case. Uh, even with this allowance of an empty string, that still seems to be true in Safari because Safari is the only one that's going to emit these. So, so Yonivar, what what you're saying is that um, empty string device IDs would only be allowed if uh, enumerated devices basically exposes the empty string. Yes. So uh, that that would we would not have to Firefox or Chrome implementation. So then we wouldn't have to change uh, any of the other browsers. Yeah. So yeah. we also f get over constrained if you have a facing mode with uh, empty string. <coughs> right. Um. <coughs> I can certainly change the PR to scope to narrow it down to only device ID. Um, I don't really know how I can spec uh, spec it so that its all device ID would be disregarded only if exposed by enabled devices first. Um, I can look at that, see whether it's uh, there's um, a nice way of expressing that. Um, I, you could you could say that if if a device ID, if if a device ID had, has been exposed. Uh, for the default device uh, with a, an ID of empty string, then empty string must match that. That would be as small as possible change, I think. Right, that, that's a valid value. Hang on. Once you do get use of media, then you stop using empty string in enumerated devices, right? And you, you treat right. that as a device change. Could it be true to say that? You know the the get used to media algorithm matches because device ID empty string matches matches at the time of the call, and then it's a device change. Or does device change mean we should over constrain? Well, how how about this? If we say if this device ID if a device ID has formerly been exposed as an empty string, an empty string is a valid uh, alternative value for that. For matching. Yeah, I think I think you can you can phrase it something like that so that existing applications. Uh, implementations don't have to do anything special with empty string. Can we uh, can we write that down somewhere? Uh, um, and, and so then it's a it's a valid device ID, and we keep it the way it is, meaning it's disregarded. Or you actually would like that we uh, change uh, distant computation if it's uh, an empty string? I would prefer that it be disregarded and we do not change any uh, uh, well, this kind of expectation. Um, would that make a difference? And I guess if you, if someone removed the default device, but in that case, uh, I, I I think Safari's implementation already is compliant. I mean, uh, it's it's meant to be. 
the default device can change, right? So <coughs> it's a, the default device is the best effort uh, abstraction anyway. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the spec doesn't even have the concept of a full device. So I think that uh, with Safari, all devices are empty string before. So, so if all of them were exposed with with uh, empty string, it means that if you pass empty string, any of those devices that you use would would match. So, how, how about if the if the device ID constraint is the empty string, the user agent may ignore it. Yeah, you can't write tests for a may. Well, you can't write tests for just what Safari either. What should happen if we make if we make it specific to enemy devices uh, exposing empty strings? Then we cannot write a test uh, for Chrome and right. And, and, uh, right. What should this happen? Is not you, anyway. So what should happen if you say exact device ID A and then that the device with ID A changes to a device with IDB. So that's technically what you're doing with empty string. You're pretending yeah. it's a different device. Is that over constraining or is that still OK? Uh, I think it's over constraining. Uh, yeah, at least in Safari implementation, it's probably over constraining, except if it's the empty string, if, if A is the empty string. OK, well, I think we should just say empty string is a special value. And I think we can work out the details in the, in the PR. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. OK, so the, the goal is to try to write a PR that would uh, not require any change from command Firefox. <coughs> OK. I have made a note on the PR. OK, thank you. Let's go on. OK, so now we're going to talk about WebRTC and the use cases. Um, so we have a PR21 submitted by Colin Jennings for secure web conferencing. And it distinguishes two use cases, one with untrusted JavaScript and another with trusted JavaScript. So I've reproduced the PR here, and hopefully it's not very long, so people can, can read it and make a judgment on it. Um, but basically, the goal here is to create a conferencing service that shows that it doesn't have access to the audio and video in clear text. Um, and the two. Uh, sub-use cases described here are one where the JavaScript comes from a trusted source and the other one where it doesn't come from a trusted source. So this is the untrusted use case. Yeah, this is actually the trusted use case. No, oh. this is the untrust untrusted use case, yes. Yeah, okay, good. So it's properly labeled. <laughs> so in this untrusted use case, the JavaScript comes from the operator of the conference bridge. <laughs> Um, and so it uses the isolated media features of WebRTC to keep the JavaScript from accessing the media. Um, the end users can see the audio and video contents, but presumably not recorded because of isolation. Uh, and the web service that provides the media switching bridge and as a use can't see the media as a result. <coughs> um, and it, it also uh, requires that some metadata about audio, such as power levels, are, are encrypted to the media server, so it can't get that either. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with this, except the last paragraph about such as ITF per quark, because this is not done yet. Or there is no conclusion about about perk work. So I'm not sure what other people think about this. Uh, yeah. Um, since it's a, a use case there, um, whenever you're using audio and video, usually you're also uh, doing text uh, chat, which might also go go through the same uh, pipe. And uh, there, it's specific to audio and video. Um, for text, it's a bit more difficult because there's not this concept. Uh, well, if the 
text isn't media. Like if it's not RTT, it won't go through the SFU the same way, right? It, it, it would go through. Uh, so we, the idea is that for text, uh, you would try to do it uh, in another uh, network path because you know, that's the idea. But at least today, it would kind of have to be done that way. Yeah, but since it's a use case, uh, I'm just wondering whether uh, text should be in scope as well. What I don't understand is why these use case require that the that the audio levels are encrypted. I mean, because a proper SVU will mostly rely on them to to work. So I don't know how the how the 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 audio audio levels of the metadata are tied to if the the JavaScript is trusted or untrusted. Well, I think it's trying to say that. Uh, that you could uh, potentially get some information about what's being said through those things. So you, can, you have, have to encrypt it to the, uh, uh, so the media server wouldn't get it. Although it's not clear, I, mean, I assume it's, I, I assume it means end-to-end -end encrypted, but it doesn't really say that. Uh, I guess the confusion is there are, it's, this is basically described double encryption. And the confusion is this paragraph doesn't explicitly uh, distinguish between the two. Like, for example, it says encrypt to the media server. This is basically the external encryption, not the internal encryption. Right. Yeah, it's not clear. So I, I think that basically for end-to-end encryption, which this is trying to describe, you would need to um, encrypt all the metadata except something that identifies the stream, such as mids and rids. Not, just... not, all, not all the metadata, we can't encrypt all the metadata end to end. For example, volume levels, some, some metadata about the resolution, etc. Uh, we need this information for uh, SFU to work. Yeah, right. Yeah, I think it's just referring uh, to the power levels. But um... well, What's the difference between power levels and resolution? If you're saying that, the, that who's talking, which is audio level pretty much, is um, leaking information, then why isn't resolution link, leaking information? Well, but who's talking is, is, can be determined by the RID or the SSRC, right? Um, no. by, the, by the SSRC, it certainly can. You know if it's, I mean, uh, you know if I it's mean, active the, or not, right? The, the SFU cannot know, the, know who's talking until it gets told somehow. No, I mean it knows. It knows the. I mean, if the SFU does things like uh, uh, just just from the uh, amount of media being sent and so forth, right? You can know that. Uh, you, uh, if you encode with a constant bitrate codec, you can't. There's no difference in the amount of media. You have to encode the power level to the to the SFU if it's going to. You do things like like uh, th three loudest speakers. Yeah, if you want to do the top end speakers, you need to have the audio level. Yeah, but that tells you who's talking, right? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, so this is what, stepping, yeah. <coughs> stepping that's, back that's the last part in the SFU selected. It, it, it strikes me that there might, might be something wrong with this as a user requirement if we're talking about, we've just spent five minutes talking about how to implement it. Um, so maybe like there's something it's not quite high level enough as a requirement. It, it sort of strays into how to do it rather than what it is we actually, what the user wants. Yeah, right. Well, it doesn't really talk about the security requirements, what exactly it's trying to hide, right, other than just the, the clear text of the audio video. Right, right. So I think kind of that's my, my initial response is that maybe we, we need to make it more like more abstract, basically, and less implementation focused. Does that make sense? Am I, or am I like? No, I mean, in, in the ITF, actually, there was a huge debate about what the security properties were exactly, what, what was being promised, and whether it was adequate. And it was never resolved. So, yeah, it is an issue, I think. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yes, I think we, we need to reformulate this so that it doesn't talk doesn't say it says what we want to want explicitly what we want to protect mm -hmm. yeah, right. it goes a good way towards that but uh, yeah uh, so more high level next yeah. use, and, and and then we look look at the other case yeah this is so, the trusted job yeah sorry before we go that who is going to do that recasting work 
Um, well, um, part, part of the issue, Dom, is that uh, I, I think we may need to have a discussion about the actual security requirements, what, it, what exactly, what, what security features we're trying to offer. Um, some of that is described in the PERC framework, uh, but the PERC framework's been criticized in, in that it doesn't, it lacks some clarity on that, so. Um, but I think that at least from my point of view, the problem is that it just puts so many details in order to try to, to push PERC. So if we, re if we remove just what has to be encrypted or not, we can discuss it later. I mean, I think that for a user, for just describing the requirement is not needed right now and it's causing more confusion that than helping. Yeah. I mean, an example of that, Sergio, would be, um, I mean, you brought up the fact that in PERC, uh, anyone can impersonate anyone else. And actually, yeah. Magnus, in his review, said, hey, there's other, there's other cipher suites that could address that. But that's an example of a security requirement that hasn't been clear. Yeah. Um, and I think that we have to address it, but I don't think that we need to address it now. So if we remove just the phrase about what needs to be created or not, it does not change the, the spirit of the of the requirement and we can just move forward. Mm. Okay, so just your suggestion, get rid of that, uh, the, the line at, at 309 and 310, some metadata is encrypted to just get rid of that. Yeah, and we can define it later when we know exactly what we want, but not at this stage. Okay. Okay, so this is the trusted JavaScript case. Uh, yeah, this is this is the and uh, the. This is the version that can, where, where that uh, corresponds to what you can do without isolated streams, and it's right. like it's how uh, anything that's encrypt enter and encrypted now would have to work. Yeah, right. So this this use case is distinguished from the other one in that there's no isolation here. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, this this is uh, really relevant when uh, either you have uh, a media server for a, from a third party uh, or you have uh, an architecture where uh, where you assume that you can detect any shenanigans from the JavaScript on your in your browser, but you cannot detect shenanigans done on the media server. Mm -hmm. So I don't get why the mid uh, trusted source is allowed to access the content of the media. Like the, the provider can access the, uh, can decrypt the media. Uh, well, the media server can't decrypt the media. Not the media server. The, the first sentence in the second paragraph. In this case, yeah. So this script. one, there's no isolation. So the um, so as an example, the app could be could use, media, could use media stream recording. Okay. Yeah, so this, this, this would be the model that would be in use if we were having, yep. having uh, yeah, uh, encryption in JavaScript. Yep, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, so I guess, I guess I guess the difference is just the first one was basically enterprise use cases where you have like something in the cloud. You don't trust the, the cloud provider. In this case, you're controlling the environment A to Z. No, uh, it's assuming I think that you don't still don't trust the media server, and even in the, uh, in the trust. Sure, server. sure, sure. Yeah, the media server is not is not always trusted, but I'm talking I'm talking about the web server, the application uh, web server, or the mm -hmm. JavaScript provider. Right, the web server would be trusted in this one. Yes. Not sure why it mentions allowing the power levels in this one, but not the other one. But that's another. No, that's, it, somewhat, it, that's somewhat it, arbitrary. It just, uh, yeah, I don't understand that. But. That's just uh, 
No, he was trying to say the same thing in both, I think. Well, I think if you already have access to the content, seeing the power levels is fine. No, it's well, uh, the server sees the, the, the right. The server. I, I think he was actually trying to really re reveal the power level to the SSU in both cases. Oh, okay. Yeah, it wasn't clear to me. So we have. Uh, uh, I think we basically have uh, that, yes, these are two valid use cases, and uh, the description needs to be high level enough that we know we, we can easily see what we're, what, what the security requirements we're Im imposing are. And uh, we, need a, we need a victim volunteer to actually massage this to be high level enough. Well, um, I, I can volunteer to do uh, an edit on it. Um, I guess we can bring it back to a next meeting and see if it's better. Yep. So, bas so basically, the, if I read the group correctly, we're, we're accepting that it makes sense to split the secure web conferencing into these two sub-use cases. And we need to f f finagle the description. Yeah. Um, do we have a, do we have acceptance of the idea of the uh, um, use of uh, uh, isolated media as it's described here? Isolated media for the untrusted and not for the trusted. I think not having isolated media uh, and in the untrusted case just looks silly. Right, right. If you don't trust the JavaScript and uh, and the JavaScript is still able to siphon off your media to a third server or whatever it wants to, then then you're actually trusting the JavaScript. Yeah, the uh, problem I have with that uh, is that remember the um, the media trust doesn't go end to end, right? The, in the isolation is a feature of uh, that can be compromised by the media server. As long as the media server is able to decrypt the media, yes. I mean, well, no, it's, it's 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 a DTLS property, right? Right. So so in theory, the SFU could could say no, we're not going to do that. Right. Um, but I guess you'd know. Like I don't know if this is flagged anywhere, but as the setting up, you you'd know that it wasn't isolated. Right. They can't do it surreptitiously. I think. Right. And if you were doing, and I mean, it's not just isolation, it's isolation and encryption so that you can convert an isolated stream into an encrypted stream that you don't have to isolate. Yeah. And then convert it back out. Yeah, yeah I, I, I still have some issue with the untrusted uh, GS case where we're, we're trying to uh, obfuscate a camera and uh, microphone, uh, but we we are not trying to hide, for instance, uh, when users are typing on the keyboard and are exchanging uh, text messages, which are uh, which might have the same kind of uh, privacy information. So it, it seems there there's some uh, unbalance and uh, there. The additional uh, concern I may have is that uh, I don't know any native app where there is this uh, difference between uh, the trust that you have and the fact that, yeah, the camera will be given, but the, uh, the native app will not have access to the camera in exactly. some weird ways. So it's, uh, it's somehow a new concept. I understand that it's the web is specific there. I, I, I'm still concerned how uh, it would actually work in, in practice and in real uh, um, web solutions. Right. Yeah, I think basically you're asking for a better privacy analysis, Yuan. Yeah. 
especially but, in the end of but the I'm, not, I'm not sure this is the right place for discuss the privacy and security details i think this, the goal of this section just use cases right then i maybe some another place for all the security security and privacy requirements maybe in a different place <laughs> Uh, security and privacy requirements should be driven by use cases. Yeah. Okay, then this, then this should be much more detailed then. <coughs> I mean, so, somewhere we have to get the details out, but uh, right. if you can first get the use cases done and then, then, and then uh, uh, untangle the details, that will be good. Yeah. Uh, I think Huren's point was whether uh, this was a use case at all that is if anyone would actually want right it. right right um, and i don't have an opinion i'm just saying that this question has merits without a deep dive in privacy right and questions. right if you say that or, or your audio and video is private but anything you text in the chat window is not that's kind of a weird that's not a use case that's just a that's just a little bit bizarre yeah. um <laughs> Okay, maybe I will comment on VPR and you can continue. Yes, please do. Thank you. Okay. Although, uh, couldn't we make the point that, I mean, the reason we're talking about audio and video is because audio and video is heavy to parse in JavaScript. I, I could see um, that as far as if you're sending text, aren't there other ways, other specs that could come up with ways to encrypt text? Uh, ways, there, so? there is, in fact, a te there is such a thing, but it's not supported in WebRTC. It's called R2T. But, okay. Yeah. There might be, but... Um, yeah, you would need also to display text without exposing it to the web application as well. Right. Mm. Right. Which is not something we have. Right. Except in captioning, maybe. I don't know. But uh, yeah. yeah. Maybe, yeah. All right. I think we've spent enough time on this one, probably. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, ECU5 is a minor one. It is that uh, when I was reading through this, uh, okay. The ability to impose a bandwidth limit across all mesh endpoints limits the build up of queues that can affect audio quality or perceived latency in the game. No, it doesn't. I mean, uh, imposing a bandwidth limit is Im imposing a bandwidth limit. So if you want to con affect audio, audio quality and per or perceived latency, you should said, say that you want to have a fair or useful control or, or management of audio quality and latency. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, this is this is again one 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 case of specify what you want, not how to do it. So, I I wanted to check with the group that this is uncontroversial. Any objections? Uh, PR thirty two basically replaces the existing text with uh, what Harold suggests. Any uh, any objections to that? Okay, sounds like your PR has support, Harold. Sounds good. Okay, distributed hash tables. Is Leonard here? Uh, yes, I'm here. So, <coughs> very happy that uh, Feroz is here to support me with this use case. So, I pass on the virtual microphone to him. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for having me here. So, uh, hi, everybody. I'm Feroz. I'll briefly introduce myself. Uh, so, I, I've used the data channel in the past for various uh, innovative use cases, I think. Uh, in uh, 2013, I started a company called Peer CDN, which was using the data channel to implement uh, next generation CDN. Uh, uh, the idea was to do efficient peer to peer delivery of static website content. Uh, and then we were acquired by Yahoo in 2013. And then in 2014, I started WebTorrent, which is an open source project to make the BitTorrent protocol work in the browser. Uh, it also used data channel as the transport. Uh, and WebTorrent has millions of, of monthly users now. So anyway, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for having me here and um, to describe this this uh, DHT use case. So um, I thought it would be useful to start with an overview of what a DHT is, just so everybody's on the same page uh, to understand the use case better. So uh, the idea is uh, DHT provides a way for millions of computers to self-organize into a network so the computers can communicate with other ones in the network and ideally share resources in some way. And they do this without the use of a central registry. So uh, because of the, the, the fact that it doesn't use a central registry in any way, this is used in nearly every decentralized protocol from BitTorrent to IPFS to DAT, uh, Ethereum, 
uh, I think Bitcoin uses something similar, uh, and it's 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 it finds its way into basically any distributed data store, uh, and you know there's there's just a lot of examples of this. Uh, I think there's even more than I listed here: I2P, Freenet, Coral, uh, Apache Cassandra, and even some Oracle products actually use uh, DHTs as well. So, uh, I mean, I'm a little biased, but I think it's a very beautiful um, uh, idea in computer science. Uh, and so I think um, if you're interested to learn more, you can read the academic paper about it here that I linked. Um, but basically the key, the key abstraction that it provides to all these various applications is that you can look up a key uh, and get the value that's associated with that key. And you can do it without uh, the peers having any central way of coordinating. And uh, despite the fact that there's no central coordination, it's extremely efficient. So you can do it in uh, O of log N time, where N is the number of peers in the network. Uh, so uh, could I go to the next slide? So uh, there's, I, I don't want to get too much into the details because it's quite a long topic. But um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the properties of Kademlia, which is the most popular uh, way that people use DHTs. Um, so you see here, this is just sort of a visual representation of, of how you uh, iteratively look up uh, the, the, the key you're looking for in the network. So the idea is that every peer maintains a routing table, which is basically contact information for other peers in the network. Uh, and then the, the, the data they're looking for, the key they're looking for, might be on some peer who they don't know how to contact directly. But what they'll do is they'll contact the closest peer. <laughs> so there's, there's a notion of closeness. Every peer has an ID, and you can be sort of, you can be close to data or far away from data. And so I will ask the closest peers that I know of, uh, like, hey, do you have this data that I want? And if the peer does, they'll provide it to me. But most likely, they won't have it. But they will be able to tell me about peers that they know that are closer to the data. And you can structure the network such that you can, in a very small number of hops, you can find the data that you're looking for. So in a, in a network of, of 10 million peers, you can actually get to the, the, the peer that has the data that you want in, in roughly 20 hops. And this is because of the log n. Um, uh, efficiency that I described earlier. So um, in general, there's like three sort of RPC messages that you would send in such a system. So you would ask a peer to store a key, uh, a value pair for you. Uh, there's Then there's find node, which is basically saying, uh, please give me information about the K closest peers to the ID that I'm looking for. And in the normal way this is used, it's often just an IP address and a port, because this is the, this is what you need to contact the peer. Obviously, in WebRTC, it's going to be different than that. Um, and then uh, lastly, find value is basically a way of, of saying it's similar to find node. But what you're saying is, uh, if you actually have the data, please provide the data instead of, uh, pr of providing me the contact information of, of people, because I just want the data. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so basically, um, WebRTC works well for applications if you have a pre-configured signaling server and all the browsers involved know to connect over HTTPS or a WebSocket to, to such a signaling server. And obviously, this is a good fit for applications like Hangouts or Skype or, or uh, something like that, where, where WebRTC is basically being used to avoid sending large amounts of video data through a central server. But it's, it's a poor fit for a distributed application that wants to avoid centralized signaling uh, entirely. So. With WebRTC, if, if a peer A wants to connect to, to peer C, then peer A needs to generate an offer, send it to peer B, and then peer B needs to forward that offer to peer C. Peer C generates an answer, and then forwards that back through peer B all the way back through peer A to, to peer A. Uh, and only at that point can we actually start the, the handshake, the DTLS handshake. So the entire process involves many network round trips, and it's it's quite slow. and uh, furthermore, the, the even bigger issue is that peer B is required to have an entry in its routing table for peer C and to, for peer A. So essentially, every peer that I want to be able to talk to or to be able to uh, introduce other peers to, I need to be connected to them at all times. Um, and because you know, uh, WebRTC connections are quite expensive, I can't maintain very many connections. Um, uh, at the same time, and, and um, my, my routing table then is, becomes a lot less useful. Um, so, um, yeah, just to emphasize again, like basically, P 
peers must remain actively connected to any peer that they wish to let other peers know about. Because there's no way that I can uh, get an offer from a peer, disconnect from them, and then later use that offer to reconnect to them. Uh, there's no way that I could I could I could send them an answer, even if uh, uh, yeah, even if that that would somehow work, if that makes sense. So um, next slide. So these are the requirements that we came up with uh, to sort of fix this this issue for this use case. So the the number one requirement is the one at the top. That is the most important one, and all the rest are are nice to haves. But the number the number one requirement here is listen or multiplex. And the concept is that an application must be able to create long-lasting signaling data. So signaling data, which I can uh, generate and have it last more than the, uh, ideally more than the, the, the duration of uh, the, the NAT, uh, you know, hole punching timeout, uh, if, if that makes sense. And uh, furthermore, that I should be able to share this signaling data one time and have multiple incoming peers use that signaling data to connect so this this idea is that that the that the offer the WebRTC offer can be stored sort of over a little bit of longer of a term in someone's routing table, and so they should be able to then provide that to to another peer, and the peer can use that to to connect. Um, so peers basically need to listen or or be able to accept incoming peer connections uh, in order to support this use case. Feras, one question: How how long is this long lasting last? I mean, what are we talking about minutes, hours, or even if the web page is open, or only while the web page is being open, or if the web page... Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I think at the bare minimum, it would be uh, the most important. The most important feature is to be able to accept multiple incoming peer connections with uh, one offer. Um, so, time-wise, like even if it was only uh, the same constraints that WebRTC has today, in, in other words, like roughly 60 seconds or so, this would still be very, very useful for the DHT use case. Uh, obviously, if we can make it last, last longer, something like 10 minutes uh, would be very, very useful because now we don't need to uh, update our routing tables so often, right? But uh, at the bare minimum, it's it's important to be able to generate this signaling data, share it with many people, and then have those people uh, connect to us without needing to forward an answer to us. Um, so it's almost like a one-way connection, if that makes sense. Um, now, obviously for the security of WebRTC, I don't know a lot about all the details, but I know that there's a need for, you know, sort of the, the answer contains information that the uh, person who generated the offer needs. Um, so, it, you know, it, it would be okay if, uh, if if there was a way for uh, the uh, the peer who generated the offer to look up the uh, a corresponding offer from the other peer uh, and get the information that it needs about that peer in that way, yeah. if that makes sense. Um, so uh, I don't know if that makes sense to people, but uh, the concept is it's sort of like an asynchronous uh, offer answer in that then in that situation, yeah. right? Um, that, so the interactivity is a big problem uh, because it requires that the peers are all connected to each other and be able, able to forward these uh, these offers and answers along. Mm -hmm. Maybe Leonard can jump in here if I'm not being clear. Yes, I'm sorry for jumping in here. So uh, the idea I had uh, for this requirement is to basically have something like ORTC has where you have uh, some kind of asynchronous sync link, sync link where you don't depend on having an uh, offer before you can send an answer. Right. Um, so you have... Basically, you post your signaling data, which could be could look like what OOTC offers at the moment. You post <coughs> your signaling data once, and multiple peers can use it to connect to you. Mm -hmm. And you can, one example, one idea I have to to keep uh, the net uh, hole open is to just continuously um, ask the stun server for you know continuously send uh, a binding request to the to the stun server. Oh, mm -hmm. right. So to to keep the the hole open. I think we don't. I don't think we need to solve it here. Um, I think it's clear that to me that this is kind of interesting space and useful for for other use cases. Actually, um, like I had a requirement that was quite like this 
where um, I want two devices that are on a on a home Wi-Fi to talk to each other, but um, the net's gone down, so I can't see the signaling server anymore. But I, they've just talked to each other. They know each other's uh, the last set of parameters, <laughs> and in theory, they should be able to reconnect, but they can't because they need to reach out to a signaling server, which will then drop out of the equation three seconds later. So um, there are a bunch of interesting uses for this technology. Uh, I kind of feel it would be nice not to solve them all here, if that makes sense. I, I, think, it's, totally I think it's doable. There's something that's definitely useful for, I think, a bunch of other use cases, uh, like you can accept multiple connections. Yeah, I, I'm not, like, again, I would sort of push back on, like, accepting multiple connections is, is is like almost a solution rather than like what you really want is some kind of persistent signaling and like how it what it does with that what the behavior is 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 uh i think we could still like iterate on so i, I wouldn't want to put that into the requirements because i don't think it's a requirement no, it's That's not, uh, I, i'm thinking that uh you're kind of describing a publish subscribe model instead of a an offer answer model for set, setting up connections, but not using those words. Mm. Yeah. So and, um, then that's certainly doable. I mean, I'm also thinking that. Uh, well, it's actually been done. So that we we have uh, pretty much all the APIs needed in uh, in the ice in the ice transport API. Uh, well, except but, but that doesn't connect to a, to a data channel at the moment. You're basically saying that this is data channels, right? Well, it, the combination of uh, an ORTC like Ice Transport and Quick would seem to solve all of these things. Is that wrong? Yeah. So why do you need WebRTC exactly? So if you were to say the signaling server or like a, uh, or an off non WebRTC component does the API for you and you just want to transfer the data efficiently, then yeah, quick data channels is probably uh, At least better. Let's jump to uh, transport now. Yeah, I think uh, I think that the, the, I mean, I'm not a for or against a quick or anything like that, but I just, I feel like this is an implementation detail. The, the requirement is really that I want to be able to connect peers in a, in a way where I can save their offer. The, I, I mean, maybe it doesn't have to do with saving offers or signaling data. That's, again, an implementation detail. But um, mm -hmm. it, to some extent, we can't get away from a little bit of implementation detail in the sense that if we want to be able to create certain network topologies, there's I need to be able to describe like f requirements I have for the way I can connect to peers, right? So I want to be able to disconnect from somebody and then connect to them again later, five minutes from now, right? That's That's... that's I think that's that's not really getting too much into implementation. That, that's talking about uh, um, a requirement for a type of application to, to be built. Yeah, so that's, I think that's, 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 the, that's the requirement you should you you, you need to put into the, into the requirement. The, the, there was In, a nice to have to some someone like can connect, well. connect to them uh, five minutes later without the signaling. Okay. So there was a nice to have on the previous slide, which I think is important, and that some of us already talked about, which was the ability to do this in worker threads hmm. right the, the use case for worker threads is that you can it's really it's qu quite uh, would enable a lot of uh, really quite interesting use cases you can imagine a service worker that sits there intercepting uh, all, all, all kinds of http requests and then instead of letting those go out to the server it handles them with a webrtc data channel instead uh, which is extremely powerful idea <coughs> extreme, extreme yeah. powerful and also of, of course extremely dangerous if you don't have the security model, right? Right. Well, yeah, I, I totally. But one interesting thing is that uh, web sockets are already allowed in workers. So uh, data channel isn't that different uh, from from a web socket. And, and Harold, you can already do this. Um, you just have to have a hidden iframe somewhere. Yep. Now, uh, what, what, we, what we have with data channels is that and they're more, more, much more loosely tied, tied to the concept of variation. But they we're getting into, into implementation again. So the, the basic requirement is that you, you should be able to know about peers 
and then connect to them without having to involve a third a signaling server in order to connect to them. Uh -huh. I think that's the essence. Yep. Yep. And uh, and then I guess the the point here about efficiency is is kind of self explanatory, but the idea there is just that often in these types of applications you want to be connected to dozens of peers at the same time and um, uh, to some extent the implementations are the, are the issue in that they're uh, like a little bit inefficient and they'll at some point prevent you from creating more peer connections if you try to create more than a few dozen uh, and uh, but I also think the protocol just overall the protocol some protocol decisions make it hard to implement WebRTC efficiently in, in, a, in, a, in a sort of way that even the best implementations might not be able to get past. So uh, ideally, we would be thinking about um, how to su support a case where the browser can have, say, I don't know, 50 uh, connections, uh, you know, and have that be a lightweight, <coughs> a lightweight abstraction. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to switch many for a number here. So if you, if you want 50, then... Uh then uh, it's nice to have it as 50. The absolute the maximum number in Chrome at the moment is uh, 500. Oh, I've seen, OK, yeah, I've seen some, some console logs about like hitting maximum numbers at much lower than that. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, not, maybe not that's from just... Chrome. Not from Chrome. OK. Well, is that roughly the numbers kind of we're talking about? Or... A few hundred would be better. Oh, okay. I mean, so so in existing DHTs that are used in all the various uh, projects I mentioned earlier, the number that uh, the number of nodes in a routing table can get up to close to a thousand nodes. Uh, and in those use cases, they're, they're, in, the, in those implementations, they're just storing IP addresses and ports for every peer. Uh, and they're uh, so it's very it's lightweight. Like to store a thousand IP addresses and ports, it's like storing a thousand strings. It's it's nothing. And they're they're, they're not even actively connected to those uh, nodes, right? Because they're using UDP, so they can just uh, fire off a packet uh, to to the to that to that port anytime they want to. So um, so the the and with twenty million nodes in a lot of these networks, you'll you'll end up having a routing table of roughly yeah a couple hundred or a thousand uh, entries in your in your routing table. Uh, so yeah, I think I'd say hundreds would be good. Yeah. So uh, some some tens of active connections and the ability to connect to connect uh, some hundreds of uh, peers pretty quickly. Yes. Yeah. To be able to connect to hundreds uh, when I want to pretty quickly, and then to be currently connected to uh, double digit numbers. I think there are two aspects of it as well. One of them is um, the it basically goes back to listener multiplex, where if you do create multiple peer connections, now you uh, allocate a lot of sockets and uh, a lot of ports, and that, that is an issue. And the other one is uh, also part of efficiency is, is that you have a lot of background noise when you have peer connections going on, many peer connections. OK. OK, and then this. This last uh, requirement here is quite a long shot, and it's probably going to be controversial. So, but I just we just had to throw it in here just um, just to get people thinking. Um, uh, but the idea here is to have uh, connections which are offer offers which are persistent across uh, like restarts of the browser. Uh, so I could store an offer and reuse it at a later stage without needing to do the signaling process. Um, but just to emphasize again the idea that uh, even just being able to reuse an offer within a much shorter period of time, like five minutes, would 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 unlock the DHT use case. And this this is not strictly required, but this 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 would uh, obviously uh, it would be really nice to be able to to restart the browser and have uh, the routing table that I I saved from six hours ago still be useful to get me connected to peers without having to uh, to to go and talk to a central server to get reconnected to the network. Um, so so to avoid that initial. Uh, bootstrapping step where you where you ask a central server to give you a couple of peers to get you going um, if that makes sense i think this is a actually a, actually should be treated as a special case of being able to connect quickly to someone you talked to before i mean uh, the idea of uh, storing a peer-to-peer -peer context is probably not uh, probably not feasible and, and uh, certainly not not uh, a requirement as an implementation Mm -hmm. So the requirement is that you can connect quickly based on stored information. 
And I think that's a reasonable requirement. Yeah, that sounds right. Uh, I don't know, Leonard, do you have thoughts? Yeah, it should probably rephrase. I agree. How many of these things are solved in a standalone ice transport? You throw an electric connection and you use O for RTC? Uh, well, ORTC, I th think, well, it doesn't, some of the reuse isn't solved in ORTC, but the, uh, the kind of uh, forking stuff that's described is. Um, yeah, so that this this actually goes directly back to to one of our first slides today, the flex size, right? Which yeah. uh, we, we, but which is kind of, and but th this is about requirements. So let's uh, let let's keep uh, let let's talk let's keep keep the talk about requirements. There might be solutions already existing that make make this easy to implement, but. Definitely, but I, th I can I think see we have flex ice being useful. Yeah, I think we have have a good uh, handle on how how we should refine the refine the requirements set here. So, yeah. will you continue to work on uh, work on the proposed text for this? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. With Leonard, yeah, we can do that. Okay, okay. Th thank you. <laughs> I have a question for you. Why, why do you want to implement uh, DHT on a browser, and why specifically with WebRTC? So, I mean, you could implement a, a DHT using WebSockets, uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, but the, the what, what, what do, I mean, the DHT does nothing. You you normally need an application on top of that. So, what, what kind of application are you envisioning on a DHT on top of a browser on top of WebRTC? So, I mean, one, one example you could imagine is uh, IPFS. Uh, this is a global file system. The idea is I know a piece of content that I want. I know the hash of that content. Uh, and I need to find who in the world has the content. Uh, so this is, in a, you know, opposite of, in a way, uh, from the way like a URL works. With the URL, I say I know the server I want to talk to, and I ask it for a specific resource by name. Um, and so in the IPFS or this, this sort of decentralized model here, I'm saying I know the content I want and I don't care who I get it from, just anyone who has it, please you know, give it to me. And then I'll verify that I got the correct content by checking, by hashing it and checking that it matches what I expect. So being able to use the DHT to find people or to find content uh, and you know, being able to store the sort of, where the key is the content's hash and the value is the content itself. That's like one very common use case. So Does that make sense? So it's web, it's WebRTC because you can run it in the browser. Yeah, and, so I can, I, I can, and, and you can run it peer to peer. Yes, yeah, exactly. So I could visit a website, and that website could load some of the <laughs> over a network like this. Uh, the the website could, you know, the, in the background, it's fetching resources from this distributed network. Um, and if, in some cases, the content isn't available anywhere else. So if I want to access it, I need to access it on IPFS or on DAT or on BitTorrent or wherever the content lives. And so I want to be able to. Uh, to do that to do that over webrtc okay i think we need to uh, move on to the uh, webrtc pc uh, material that yanivar has prepared so and thank you thank you this was uh, i learned something <laughs> great <laughs> thank you thank you okay uh so leonard permission api Right. Um, okay, so I, I made a pull request to try solve the, the problem of, uh, well, basically uh, having a solution to for use cases that can't use, get user media to access, well, I call them the best available mode and the default mode. Um, so the status quo is that without, without get user media, uh, you usually uh, have IP handling mode greater or equal than two, and uh, for terminology, I'm I'm calling this uh, the default mode. And uh, with get user media, you usually have IP handling mode one, and I call that the best available mode. So the problem with that is that uh, not all use cases can use get user media. Um, we have receive only media use cases, and data channel use cases. 
and they obviously can't ask for camera access. So, and, and these are also often innovative uh, local network use cases, which makes, uh, well, they could very much use IP handling mode one because they operate on local networks more often. Um, so, uh, I, I, I also see that uh, the default mode and the best available mode, they are diverging further. For example, in LibMob RDC, the MDNS uh, host candidate obfuscation is uh, now going to, to be deployed, as far as I can see. And yeah, that, that's uh, making the local network use case harder without get user media. So next slide, please. So the goal here is um, trying to solve this is to allow to resolve the privileged escalation of get user media and clarify when and how IP handling modes are being applied when they are effective and how they are being signaled to the application. Um, and of course, to ensure use case uh, neutrality. So I, um, I made a proposal to add the direct connection permission. It's a new permission to the permission API. Um, and uh, out of the um, well section that, that says basically media devices, camera or microphone, they may also implicitly grant direct connection. So that, that is the starting point. Then there's uh, an additional API for WebRTC PC, which basically extend, extends the RTCP connection in two ways. It's one, one static method and one new event. Um, so uh, yeah, next slide, please. Basically, you have a method that you call uh, on, on a static method that you call, that you can call to register a direct connection interest. So you are interested in, it, it mentions, well, it raises an interest of an application to access the best available mode. Um, it can do that at any time, but ideally it should do that uh, with providing context. And I have um, added a couple of examples how to provide context in, in the pull request. And then the application can register a connection upgradable event. So this is the point where it gets a little bit tricky, but so the API has been API has been developed in a way that it allows to allows um, user agents to experiment. So basically, what happens now is that there is some mechanism going on that at some point may or may not uh, grant the direct connection permission in whatever uh, user inter whatever way the the browser wants to or the user agent wants to notify this uh, request. And then the connection upgradable event fires if and only if the mode has been upgraded to the best available mode. So as it is a static method, it would apply to all peer connections of the current realm. And since, as, as I mentioned, that uh, get user media may implicitly grant this connection, uh, this, this permission, um, it may also fire as a result of, get, uh, of calling get user media. And then the application can uh, choose to do an ice restart. So, sorry. Uh, so, so con providing context is something uh, important, I think. Um, so, for some use cases, it may make sense to do this when the chosen candidate pair is not host to host or host to something. Um, for voice and video conference, it may make sense to call this method when joining a session or a room but you only intend to listen. You don't intend to share your camera or mic, <laughs> for example, when joining this uh, conference, but not, you know, not going to present anything. Um, and for data transmission, this could be uh, used when, uh, for example, when having selected a file to send to the other peer. So as, as a nice side effect of this API, browsers that implicitly grant uh, direct connection permission would now also grant it uh, would not also trigger the the connection upgradable event so that would be a clear indication to the application that it can uh, do an ice restart and it would actually do have a positive effect or it could be could have a positive effect the connection um so sorry yeah 
Um, also, there is no downgrade mechanism in this pull request, so uh, because it doesn't really make sense to ground downgrade anything if you have already leaked, basically leaked uh, the host candidates, because they are already known at this point to the application. So downgrading would only be effective for future peer connections. Okay, next slide, please. So the, the, the probably the, the most pressing issue here is uh, how is this being reflected in the user interface? How, how does the user experience look like? And like I said, this API is tailored to encourage the, the right connection permission being granted without having to rely on the prompt. So this gives UI designers room for experimentation. Uh, on the right side, we see an example how I would envision it, for example, being used in uh, Firefox, which is something um, I talked about with uh, Jan Eva. So it could be, for example, move to the side panel and then there would be an icon representing our, you could um, activate, uh, you could grant a permission here to have a more direct connection. And then there's a small question mark that could, for example, explain what is a direct connection. Yeah, so that is basically the idea. So summing it up, Basically, the, it's a very small API service uh, in trying to uh, get, get it to have a use case neutral permission request. And so, uh, so what? Why is the, did you make want to make a static static method and with no return? So, you mean the, the the method that it doesn't return anything? I mean, you, you have a static method and an event, which uh, kind of separate uh, separates the the th the thing into two piece two pieces. Uh, right. So why? And in particular, use of static means that you are assuming that uh, you have exactly the same direct direct connection interest for all. For all peer connections inside inside a context. Okay, so first uh, the static method. I think it would be hard to separate it um, for each peer connection because thinking of this example I've, I've uh, presented in the next slide is. Uh, I mean, you would have to basically separate separate each peer connection, um, and it would be well. It's it's not really visible. A peer connection is something reflected in the UI. Uh, mm. So, so it wouldn't be clear which peer connection am I now granting a direct connection, a direct connection permission, and the event. Um, this is about. I mean, the alternative would have been to make it a promise, and I have chosen to not do this after a long discussion with Janiva to support uh, use support um, this not being a prompt. So. This should really encourage uh, implementers to not make it a prompt, but to to experiment making it somewhere something that isn't that um, well that direct. So it doesn't ha doesn't necessarily have a direct <coughs> um, how would I call it? it? Doesn't have a direct effect. For example, it could be that this uh, thing here shown on the right, the example. Is always visible, and the method doesn't do anything in in the in the browser, because if the browser always shows it, uh, it's you know it's it's always visible in the side panel. So, but it could be an uh, indication for the browser to, to you know show this icon on in the side panel to visualize that there is some something the user can do, something the user can grant. Maybe Jan Eva can also comment on that if he wants to. Sure. I, I think the uh, Harold makes a good point that we could make the method uh, part of a peer connection object, and then maybe the event uh, would only fire uh, for that peer connection. I think the point of a static method was that this is really about permission, so it applies to the whole page, and you might want to call this before you create a peer connection object. Uh, the other thing I liked with uh, not using a promise is that you could actually fire the connection upgradable event even for uh, apps that don't uh, haven't registered an interest, uh, for instance, uh, 
use agents may use to want to do this uh, implicitly when you give the camera and microphone permission. Or uh, if you create a peak connection, for example. Right. So currently, uh, 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 camera and microphone access is too, in my opinion, too tightly coupled to peer connections, and that uh, and that that forces and that encourages uh, JavaScript applications to always want to get those first because they're going to have a better connection. And uh, this is an attempt to try to decouple that there, uh, so that you can create peer connections independently of whether you have camera and microphone permission, and then later. If you have uh, more trust, if more trust is identified, you can get an event fired on you that you can then do an ICE restart and, and, and improve your connection. So and I think we can always uh, work on the details in the PR, but uh, you know, as a general sense of the room, do people think this is a good way to go? This is UN. Um, in, in general, I, I like the idea that we decouple get to the media and direct connection. Um, that said, I think it's work that we should tackle in web of CNV. Uh, not not now. Um, the idea of the event and so on that, that that's nice if we find uh, good heuristics that uh, or good cases where we are actually changing dynamically uh, during the lifetime of a page. Uh, we we don't have that right now in. In, in browser implementations, except for get user media, and applications can already do that. So I think we should uh, reuse case there and um, try to work it work on it in Robert CNV. Um, dig into uh, good heuristics that could use uh, that uh, mechanism, and if we if we find good heuristics, then uh, <laughs> we and we implement this mechanism or so, something. Close to, to that mechanism, but uh, um, I would prefer that we do not uh, add this mechanism until we are sure we will be able to uh, use it uh, meaningfully. So uh, an extension spec then? Uh, yeah, we about CND and the extension spec and yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. One 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 question: Do you have a, a pull request towards the permission spec on this one? Um, I haven't made one yet. But I have already I, uh, written it, it um, down as as a yeah as a, in, as part of my fork. Um, uh, so I, so it, uh, the reason I'm asking is that if I remember the permission spec correctly, which is far from obvious, then you already have the ability to register for a, a no, notification when the permission changes. I forget exactly what 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 is called, but I think that when you get when you you flip direct connections from uh, from disallowed to allowed, you are able to get to get an event. So that part of the spec might actually not be not need to be an if it ties to the permission spec. This part of the uh, part of the spec not, might not need to be in WebRTC at all. Uh, and in fact, now that you mentioned it, there is or was a more controversial aspect of the permission spec about mm -hmm. requesting permission, and that could replace the uh, register direct connection interest idea. Um, right. uh, another comment related to um, the direct connection permission. Um, when you deny direct connection, uh, when you deny camera access, then there's no camera stream. When you currently, when if you do not allow a direct connection, you still be able to have a direct connection in practice, because you might go through server reflexive. So it's um, it's only in some specific cases that direct connection might have uh, an impact on the user um, experience. So I mean, it's um, I'm a bit on the verge related to that. Um, I believe that all of the permissions uh, are very clear. It's it's yes or no, and there with direct connection, it's only in some cases that you have uh, that you will grant direct connection. And so in many cases, you will uh, the direct connection granted or not will have no effect at all. Um, so if you implicitly grant direct connection, what does it mean to uh, deny direct connection, for instance? Does it mean that you will not provide any candidates at all? So is it like something like um, uh, disabling the whole WebRTC peer connection uh, feature 
or not. Uh, no. There are a lot of things like that where, that we, we need to define and discuss. And um, well, I, yeah, it's, it's really to me it's really exploratory uh, work right now. Right. Uh, I think the permission here is only for a direct connection as defined as mode one, I think, or best available mode. So if you don't have permission to best available mode, then you, you can still do WebRTC. It's not a, a permission to turn off WebRTC. To default yeah. mode. So, uh, I mean, of course, we can bike shed on the name uh, of, of the permission. I mean, it might not be ideal because it kind of implicitly uh, says, what if, <laughs> if, if is it not going to be direct connection? I agree with that, but I wouldn't have I, I couldn't come up with a better name for it, if you know what I mean. Right. You could say, you know, mode one, best available connection, something like that. That's We shouldn't change what it is based on its name, I think. But good luck putting that in a UI. <laughs> UI-wise, it's very difficult. Honestly. Yeah. So what are the next steps here? Good question. So I guess what I'm hearing is that uh, it's probably a not a one data feature. It also feels like it can be separated fairly nicely from the spec without too much impact. Uh, there are some good questions about more specific integration with the model of the permission spec. Um, so one way or another, I think this probably needs to move separate from WebRTCPC, uh, whether that's through incubation or a new repository of the working group or something like that, uh, I don't have a strong opinion. I think one thing we maybe could do in the time scale, coming back to something you answered, was that in theory we could be gathering some metrics and heuristics about like where this might have helped. And I don't know if 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 any of the um, browser vendors are in a position to to generate stats or, or comments on that. But I think it would be really that would be a nice use of time is is to get a sense of of just how many times this would have helped. Um, is that something that we think we could generate somehow? I'm not even sure if it would be that useful because this is highly use case dependent. I mean, it kind of depends on. Do you have a turn server? Does your use case actually need a turn server? Um, do you even have a stun server? And so uh, this kind of breaks or makes very specific use cases. Yeah, I, I think we do have a sense of some very large scale use cases that are currently broken. Um, an example of that would be these massive online courses which don't call get user media. Um, and don't want to run through a turn server because it would disrupt the university. So, yeah, for these use cases, I'm not quite sure. Uh, yeah, more, more one might be needed. That's true. Yeah. So. Um, the next issue was whether we should have something for this in Weber C and B use cases. Yeah, basically, um, I filed the issue before I started working on the PR. So I thought this would be useful for WebRTC PC because uh, the connection upgradable event is something that is currently missing. So you, the application doesn't know when it can do an ICE restart, uh, and it would actually it may benefit from it. So this is what the connection upgradable event is is about. Um, and then there, of course, is is, is a method that would um, provided in, in a use case neutral way. Uh, so this was more of my backup plan. So in case you know this isn't being accepted, then we could, uh, if required, move it to to NV. I think that makes sense to me. Okay, so uh, there's support for adding this to where it's CMB. Yeah. Okay. We can certainly wordsmith on that. But yes, that's a requirement. So action item is to 
create a PR for <coughs> NV requirement? Uh, we have one, I guess, PR 14 in WebRTC and the use cases. Um, yeah. But I guess uh, we can have people review it. Yeah, I, I should probably, um, is, is that mine? I think yes. Um, yeah, it's yours. Yeah, so <laughs> uh, we'll have, I, I will have a look at it if I need to rephrase anything and then I'll ask for a review. Yep, I'll uh, I added a comment. I mean, if the title of the use case is file sharing, then you cannot add the uh, requirements for one-way media. You need a new require new new title of the new section for one-way one-way media. Yeah, actually, uh, I think there's some co there's a conferencing use case which actually would need this for the massive online course case. But uh, anyway, we can we can figure out where to put it yeah. exactly. And request user comp and yeah, more com more comments than text. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately, I think we're just about out of time. Um, so. Well, <clears throat> so this is Jan Avar. So uh, I did have a number of slides prepared uh, for uh, WebRTC 1.0 issues, and I know on the list it was said that this would be the meeting, the last meeting where we yeah. would entertain major changes. So I'm hoping we can get an extension or at least an exception so that I can present these. Yeah, what I'm thinking is, uh, and I don't know how it works with the ITF meeting, but we can do one in another interim in July. Um, okay. So probably we are, I'll send out a, a, a doodle right away so we can have this be the focus of the next interim. That'd be great. Okay. Early, well, early July. Yeah, early July. Okay, good. Thank you, everybody. All right, thanks. Bye. Okay, thank you. Bye, Bye for Thank now. you.